Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Museum. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my pleasure to serve as the director of both the library in Ann Arbor and the museum here in Grand Rapids. We are delighted to have you here this evening, especially as it seems that spring has finally come to West Michigan. Yay. <laughs> let, there be a, let there be a chorus of amens to that. As you know, 2013 is the centennial year of President Ford's birth, and both we and our partner this evening, the Ford School of Public Policy and the Ford Foundation, are planning a number of special programs to take course over the course of the year. Tonight's program is unique, as it is the very first partnership event between the Ford Presidential Museum, the Ford Presidential Foundation, and the University of Michigan Ford School of Public Policy. As you may know, the newer presidential libraries have often been built with an institute or school of public policy adjacent to them. And while each entity has its own mission and agenda, the library museum and the school or institute often collaborate on public programs or initiatives. In our case, because of our split locations, collaboration gets a little bit more complicated. The Ford Library and Museum are run as one institution, but the two parts are located 130 miles apart. The Ford School at the University of Michigan, while named for President Ford, is on the main campus and has lo a long history of its own evolution, which predates the existence of this library and museum. Tonight's program is a new initiative whereby we seek to uh, bring a new form of programming here to Grand Rapids by partnering with the dean and the faculty of the Ford School. Tonight's program is brought to you with the support of the National Archives and Records Administration, which is our parent body, and with additional support from the Ford Presidential Foundation, which makes possible most of our public programs and events. Before we get started, one small item of housekeeping, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. The Dean of the Ford School of Public Policy is Susan Collins, who is the Joan and Sanford Weil Dean of Public Policy. Her specialty area of research is international economics, in which she has published widely. Dean Collins holds degrees from Harvard and MIT, and previously held faculty positions at Georgetown and Harvard, and was also a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund. In addition to her role as dean, Susan Collins is currently a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. She is vice president of the Association for Pro Professional Schools of International Affairs. She's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and was recently named to the board of directors of the Detroit branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Please welcome Dean Susan Collins, who will introduce our program. Elaine, thank you very much for that very kind introdu introduction. I am just delighted to be here today and uh, with a number of members of the Ford School team. Um, it is really wonderful for us to have partnered with the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum on tonight's event. As Elaine already mentioned, this is a special initiative that we are very proud to be presenting here this evening. When the Ford School initiated this project, we were really eager to showcase the work of our Center on Local, State, and Urban Policy, or Close Up, to a broader Michigan audience. And we're very grateful to have a number of partners here, in particular at the Presidential Museum, to welcome and support tonight's event. And we really also look forward to future collaborations and um, hope that, uh, that you will come and join us as we move that initiative forward. Well, you've come here tonight to hear about a very timely and important issue for Michigan citizens, and that is local government funding. Leading this presentation this evening are researchers from the Ford School's Close-Up Center, Tom Avaco and Deborah Horner. Their full bios are in our program, and I invite you to take a look at those. I won't uh, go through them in detail here tonight, but we're delighted that they are able to join us. Unfortunately, because of a last-minute family issue, the director of Close Up, Professor Barry Rabe, is not able to join us tonight, and uh, he sends his regrets. He has really become the Ford School's resident scholar and expert on President Ford, and I know he was looking forward to doing, as he does so eloquently, 
um, speaking about President Ford and also to hearing the close-up team present about the very important local funding issues. If he were here tonight, I know that Barry would want to acknowledge a very important tie that really binds together Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, and that is that President Ford considered both to be his home. Well, as you've already heard and may already have known, 2013 marks the 100th anniversary of President Ford's birth. And as you will read in your insert in our program, um, the Ford School has planned a number of very special events to celebrate his remarkable life and extremely impactful career. And for example, I wanted to highlight that on April 16th, General Brent Scrocroft will visit the Ford School to dedicate a small replica of the statue of President Ford that is both in the Capitol Rotunda and also is in front of the museum that you would have seen when you came in the entrance uh, recently. And so I hope that uh, all of you will join us for that event. And I'll also ask you to help us celebrate this centennial and share the news about all of the ways that President Ford made such an impactful legacy in many ways. And we had a number of our Ford legacy buttons out there, and I hope that uh, you will, as we do, wear one proudly and share them. And so I invite you to uh, take a button if you did not already when you came in. And so now for the main event, tonight we'll hear a presentation from Close Up, the longest standing research center at the Ford School, and a really unique institution among public policy schools. It's dedicated to helping, among other things, to understand public opinion of elected officials. And Close Up has engaged very uh, closely with policymaking and policy leaders around the state of Michigan. The most recent survey is on funding local government, and that's the focus of the discussion this evening. A word about our format, uh, Tom will introduce the discussion by providing some background about the history of some of the current events that have affected local government funding in Michigan, and then highlighting close-ups findings, Deborah Horner will discuss some of the ways that Michigan is moving forward on this issue. We are going to save about at least 20 minutes for question and answers at the end of the program and a discussion with the audience, and I hope that you picked up a card when you came in. Volunteers will be collecting the question cards, so please pass them to the aisles at around 7.50 p.m. And Ford School alum and former city manager of Grand Rapids, Kirk Kimball, will read the questions. And so we look forward to that part of the event this evening. And with no further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Tom Avaco and Deborah Horner. Tom? And uh, the Ford Presidential Museum and the Ford Foundation for uh, hosting us. And uh, in particular, thank you all for uh, being here tonight uh, for a discussion that we think is uh, really a, a critical issue for communities all across this great state of ours. Uh, before we begin with the survey findings, I want to give uh, just a brief overview of the Michigan Public Policy Survey itself so that you have a, a sense of uh, where these data uh, come from and, and what they represent. The, um, uh, the Michigan Public Policy Survey is a twice per year uh, survey of uh, local governments, general purpose local governments all across the state. We take a uh, census style approach to this, so we try to get responses from every county, city, uh, township, and village. Uh, and there are a lot of them in Michigan, 1,856. Uh, we have been uh, remarkably lucky to have uh, responsive local officials working with us on this. In the last three surveys, we've gotten 72, we've gotten responses from 72% of these uh, jurisdictions, uh, which is pretty remarkable for survey research. We, uh, we target the chief elected official and the chief appointed official in each of these uh, local jurisdictions. So we are interviewing uh, mayors and, and city administrators. Uh, county board chairs and county executives, township supervisors, village presidents, and so on. And we have covered a, a wide range of topics in these surveys. You can see a partial list of the topics here. Uh, tonight's topic, we think, is uh, perhaps the most important issue that we've dealt with yet, 
over about eight surveys that we've conducted. Uh, this really gets to the heart of local government, which is uh, the ability of local government to help improve quality of life in our communities. Uh, the, um, uh, the topic uh, begins with kind of a, a general overview of what has been uh, called uh, a local government fiscal crisis, which at its heart really is quite simple. Uh, local governments have been dealing with declining uh, revenues over a long period of time, at the same time that uh, costs to provide public services continue to rise. And this has created pretty severe budget gaps that have to be dealt with uh, in some fashion. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start tonight with a couple of quotes that we think uh, set the stage and, and really kind of sum up the issue at hand uh, pretty succinctly. The first quote is from uh, Ed Kurtz, uh, who uh, is currently the uh, city manager in um, uh, Flint. I'm sorry, the, uh, the emergency financial manager in, in the city of Flint. Uh, Mr. Kurtz uh, recently uh, said, uh, within five years, all of our urban cores are going to be where Flint is at today, unless some significant changes are made. Uh, the way we finance cities is broken. Uh, that, of course, is not good news. That's a, that's a big red flag to capture all of our attention. The, uh, the second quote is from uh, David Hollister. He's the former mayor of uh, the city of Lansing, a uh, very respected local official. He's currently heading up that city's uh, Blue Ribbon uh, Commission, uh, which is making recommendations to the city of Lansing to help it avoid its own fiscal crisis and an emergency manager. In uh, presenting uh, recommendations of that commission to city council, Mr. Hollister said, we cannot continue to do all things for all people. Uh, we try, as we've done in the past, uh, we've tried doing more with less, and that worked for a while. Uh, but doing more with less has uh, reached its limits, and now we're suggesting that we're going to do less with less. Uh, that uh, really sums up uh, what we have uh, heard here from, uh, from local leaders across the state. Uh, and it also uh, fits perfectly with our uh, presentation outline. So I want to give you a quick sense of, of uh, the presentation that we'll be uh, uh, reviewing tonight. We're, we're breaking it into three main sections. Uh, the first section here uh, is a retrospective. It looks back at the last decade or so, uh, a period of local government retrenchment, uh, a downsizing, uh, which has been driven by these uh, declining revenues and rising costs. Uh, this section uh, really, uh, it, it concludes with a look at, at fiscal health today of local governments, and uh, it could be subtitled The Era of Doing More with Less. Uh, the second section, uh, which Deborah will present, uh, is prospective. It looks forward and reviews what local government leaders tell us they see coming down the road in their jurisdictions, uh, and that could be subtitled The Era of Doing Less with Less. And uh, the third section is also prospective, it reviews what local government leaders tell us they think should happen in order to help uh, protect fiscal health in their jurisdictions and uh, their ability to provide public services. Uh, now, there's a lot of talk these days about data-driven decision-making. Uh, tonight's presentation is going to be a data-driven uh, discussion. We will uh, review a lot of data from our surveys. Uh, at times, it may feel a little bit like sitting in class in Ann Arbor. Uh, we're going to do our best to uh, explain the data as clearly as possible, but uh, please do write down your questions as we're going along, and, and we'll look forward to uh, discussing them. So uh, in terms of re uh, reviewing the data, we're going to start with uh, a look back to the early 2000s uh, and, and looking at one of the most important sources of funding for local government, and that is revenue sharing from the state government. Uh, revenue sharing comes in two main streams to local governments. Uh, the first is constitutional revenue sharing, and the second is called statutory revenue sharing. Uh, the constitutional revenue sharing is the lower portion of these bars. Uh, this is one bar for each fiscal year stretching back uh, in time. Uh, so the shaded in portion is the constitutional revenue sharing. This is really an automatic part of the annual state budget. Uh, the formulas are written into the Constitution, so there's really no debate about how this, uh, this money flows to local governments. And you can see that going back to about uh, 2000, uh, 2001, uh, it was uh, about uh, 650 million or so. It has grown very slowly and steadily for the most part over that, over that decade. 
uh, where, uh, to about 671 million. So a very slow, steady growth in constitutional revenue sharing. Statutory revenue sharing is a different story. That's the upper portion of these bars, and it is part of the annual budgeting process. So it's determined by the state legislature and the governor each year. Uh, you can see clearly uh, it peaked at uh, $684 million in fiscal year 2001, and it has been cut repeatedly since then uh, uh, to the point where it was $215 million last year, about a third of what, of what it was a decade ago. In that, uh, in that decade, these cuts in, in the red shaded area sum up to uh, more than $4 billion that has not been invested in uh, local communities across the state. So uh, this has really been a major blow to local government finances uh, all across Michigan. Uh, now we'll take a look at, uh, at how these kinds of cuts uh, play out for different kinds of communities. Uh, this, uh, there's a lot of data on, on this slide. So I'm going to uh, kind of walk us through it slowly. Um, once we understand how to, how to interpret these data, we have additional slides that kind of follow the same format and we'll, we'll move through those ones uh, much faster. Uh, the first thing uh, to notice here is that this is dealing with, uh, with state aid, declining state aid. So it is tied to that last screen that we just saw. Although this deals with more than just revenue sharing, there are other types of uh, state aid that flow to local governments. Uh, the next thing to see is we're dealing with four years of data. These are our last four surveys from the Michigan Public Policy Survey. And uh, uh, the final thing to understand is we've broken Michigan's local governments down by their population size, uh, the population size of their communities. So down here on this end, we have Michigan's uh, smallest jurisdictions uh, with fewer than 1,500 residents. As we uh, move to the right, uh, increasingly large communities until we get out to this side, uh, which are, are Michigan's largest urban communities, such as uh, Grand Rapids, uh, that have more than 30,000 uh, residents. So uh, if we look down here at this first uh, light green bar, uh, you see that's from our 2009 survey. And what it shows is that about 61% of these small local governments were taking cuts in their state aid in 2009 compared to what they got in, in 2008, the year before. If we move forward one year to 2010, we see that that grew to about 81%. So this, this aspect of the local government fiscal crisis was growing more widespread between 2008 and 2009, uh, and then 2010, affecting uh, more of these uh, local governments. Um, however, by 2011, in, in the light uh, blue bars, you see that uh, it has begun to ease back. Uh, it was down to about 63% uh, of the small governments taking cuts in state aid, and it continued to ease back in 2012 to the point where about 50, uh, 51 or 2 percent of these small governments uh, taking cuts. So that decline is good news for the local governments who are no longer in those bars, but for the local governments that are still in these bars, uh, it's important to understand that these are cuts on top of cuts the year before, on top of cuts the year before. And so uh, staying in these bars becomes increasingly more difficult as time goes by. And uh, our surveys began in 2009, but as we saw in that last slide, uh, cuts in statutory revenue sharing began back in 2001. So if, if our survey had begun earlier, we would see these bars stretching back in time. Uh, this has been uh, a very long period of um, severe fiscal stress for, uh, for local governments. Next, uh, we will stay on this aspect of the fiscal crisis, which is declining revenues, and we'll look at uh, the most important source of funding for local government, and that's property tax revenues. Uh, we see similar patterns on this slide as we saw, uh, I, I'm sorry, there's uh, one other thing I want to point out on this last slide, is uh, differences between small and large local governments. So in 2009, again, 61% of the small jurisdictions were taking cuts in their state aid. In the large jurisdictions, about 85% were taking cuts in state aid. Uh, this is a very common thing that we find on these surveys. Uh, fiscal issues uh, much more difficult in the large communities uh, compared to the small ones. And uh, that's a pattern that we'll see uh, tonight on numerous slides, including uh, property tax revenue declines. Uh, so again, we see uh, things getting worse between 2009 and 2010 uh, for just about every type of, of local government. 
and then beginning to ease back again uh, in 2011 and uh, 2012. Uh, these uh, declining uh, uh, property tax revenues really came from the housing sector collapse uh, that, that launched uh, the Great Recession back around uh, 2007 or so. And again, uh, this is the most important source of funding. So the fact that we have such a high percentage of local governments of all uh, sizes taking these cuts uh, is another indicator that this has been uh, an enormous source of fiscal stress. Uh, we have additional uh, data points on uh, declining revenues. We won't show any more slides uh, on that, but for instance, local governments have been taking cuts in uh, fees for services, uh, fees for licenses, and so on. Uh, but instead of continuing to look at declining revenue, we're going to uh, switch to the other side of the, of the, of the fiscal uh, crisis and look at the rising costs. And so uh, the first thing that uh, we'll look at here is uh, rising health care costs for local government employees. Uh, now, here we see uh, dramatic differences between the large and the small communities. And this is because uh, these, uh, these very small local governments, uh, quite a few of them uh, have very few employees uh, in the first place, or if they do have employees, quite a few of them simply don't provide uh, fringe benefits to them. Uh, so fewer local governments down here are facing this source of fiscal stress. Uh, but even still, uh, close to 40% in 2009, in the large jurisdictions, uh, 80%. Uh, so this uh, has been another source of, of uh, extreme fiscal stress. And again, if our surveys had begun before 2009, we would see this stretching back in time. Uh, rising uh, health care costs have been an issue for uh, quite a long time. Uh, the next uh, thing will, will stay on the side of, of the rising cost uh, equation and uh, look at pension costs. Uh, again, uh, similar to the last slide, we see significant differences between the large and the small jurisdictions. Uh, and um, uh, we see this uh, pattern of things kind of easing after, uh, after 2010, certainly, in this case, after uh, 2009. Uh, but again, if our survey stretched back in time, we would see these bars uh, going back. Uh, retirement and, and pension cost systems for uh, local government employees uh, have been an issue for, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's important to understand that there's, uh, for, for jurisdictions that are still in these bars as of 2012, there's a compounding problem going on here. These are rising costs in 2012 on top of rising costs from 2011, which were on top of rising costs from 2010 and so on. So uh, there's a compounding uh, problem over time where these costs become uh, ever more difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, now, similarly, we have uh, quite a few other data points uh, about rising costs for local governments, but we won't show any more slides on that front. Uh, but for instance, as, uh, as gasoline uh, prices rise for all of us, uh, it's more expensive for local governments to have police patrols uh, out on our streets. It's more expensive for the fire department to uh, make a fire run. Uh, more expensive for parks and maintenance department to get across town to mow parks and so on. Uh, but so you get the idea. Uh, we've had uh, declining revenues and rising costs that create this uh, pretty severe uh, budget hole. So now we're going to switch gears and look at how Michigan's local governments have responded to that budget crisis. And uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is actually something that very few local governments in Michigan have done, and that is to be increasing their levels of debt. Uh, we think this is actually a, a pretty good sign. Now, uh, you know, very low here, below 20% uh, for the most part. Uh, debt, of course, is, is in and of itself is not a bad uh, thing. Uh, debt is a very useful tool for local governments to, um, uh, to manage very large infrastructure projects that can only be paid off a little bit uh, each year. Uh, so debt isn't bad on its own, but if local governments had been issuing debt to cover this budget gap, that would be a very bad financial management practice. And so we see, uh, for the most part, uh, they have not been doing that. That's, that's a good sign. Instead of that, what we found is local governments uh, relying on what's called their general fund balance. Uh, for the purposes of tonight, that can be thought of kind of like a rainy day fund. So uh, local governments should keep about a 15% or so general fund balance each year. It's unobligated funding that can be used for emergencies, uh, to, um, to deal with you know, the, the rise and fall of the economy and, uh, and aid. 
so what we saw in, uh, especially in the early years of, of our survey and uh, at the, you know, the height of the Great Recession, was local governments relying on their rainy day funds to help fill in that budget gap. And that's a much better practice than issuing new debt, which of course brings new costs with it. In addition to relying on their rainy day funds, local governments have been very active at downsizing their staff levels. Uh, again, we see very significant differences between the large and the small jurisdictions for the reasons that we've said these, uh, these governments don't have many employees. But uh, in jurisdictions that do have uh, lots of employees, cutting staff uh, has been uh, uh, one of the main strategies to deal with this fiscal crisis to try to, uh, try to cut costs. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the Rockefeller Institute at uh, the State University of New York at Albany uh, recently put out a report on uh, declining local government employment across the nation, and they found that on average, uh, employment levels were down about 3.5% since its peak in 2008 on, on the national level. In Michigan, these employment levels are down about 8.6%. So if things are bad across the nation for local governments, they are really bad here in Michigan. And we know, of course, in, uh, in large urban jurisdictions, employment levels uh, in many cases are down 30% or more. So uh, this has been a prime strategy to deal with that fiscal crisis. In addition to uh, cutting staff, local governments uh, that have employees have been actively shifting their health care costs to be paid increasingly by the employees themselves. So uh, these include things like monthly uh, health care premiums, uh, co-pays for doctor's visits and prescriptions and so on. Uh, this again, uh, you know, big differences between the large and small. Uh, we didn't ask this question in 2009, so we only have uh, three years worth of data here. Uh, but uh, you can see for jurisdictions that have lots of employees, this has been uh, one, of their, one of their key strategies, again, to close that budget gap. Uh, in addition, the, uh, the most uh, common um, action that we have seen from local governments is increasing their intergovernmental cooperation, uh, working with neighboring jurisdictions to jointly provide services and share in the costs. So that can include things like uh, a regional fire uh, department, uh, countywide 9-11 dispatch service and so on. Uh, this has been another one of the key strategies to close that budget gap. Uh, we actually had done uh, one of our previous uh, surveys in this program focused just on intergovernmental cooperation. That was in uh, 2010. And at that time, we found that it was uh, incredibly common all across the state. Uh, more than 70% of local governments were in some kind of formal uh, uh, joint project with neighboring jurisdictions. So the fact that uh, even though they started from a very high base on this kind of activity, uh, that it has been such a common strategy uh, is, is pretty noteworthy. And then uh, the last thing that we'll look at uh, here uh, in terms of strategies is uh, cutting uh, uh, service levels. So um, uh, certainly in jurisdictions that provide a lot of services, and again, small jurisdictions that have few employees tend to provide few services to start with, so they don't have many places to cut. But in jurisdictions that do provide a lot of services, cutting back on service levels has been a fairly common strategy. But what stands out to us here is that this is much less common than most of the other actions that we've just looked at. It's less common than cutting staff. It's less common than shifting your health care costs to be paid by your employees. It's less common than working with neighboring jurisdictions. And what this says to us is that uh, local governments have really tried to protect frontline services from cuts as far as they could. Uh, this is the era of trying to do more with less. Um, so we're almost done with this, uh, with this first portion of, of the, uh, the presentation, but um, before we, we switch gears and kind of look to the future, we want to kind of step up to like a 10,000 foot view and, and get a summary look at, uh, at local government fiscal health, uh, how it has changed over the last four years, uh, and where it stands today as local governments emerge from the Great Recession. And so in our surveys, uh, we ask an awful lot of questions on fiscal health issues, on budget policy, and so on. Uh, we, we use one particular question as kind of our summary uh, uh, fiscal health indicator. And that is asking whether the local government is uh, better able or less able to meet its fiscal needs today uh, compared to how it was doing last year. 
And uh, as we've seen with some of these other slides, what we found was uh, things getting worse between 2009 and 2010, and then beginning to uh, ease back in 2011 and continuing on that course in 2012. Uh, and so these next slides show how that kind of played out geographically across the state. So what we see here is uh, from 2009, and this is at a county level, uh, and uh, green shaded counties are where less than 25% of the local governments within that county were in declining fiscal health at that time. So green here is relatively good. Yellow shaded counties are where between uh, 25 and 50% of the governments in that county were in declining fiscal health, so yellow is worse. And red shaded counties, such as Kent here, uh, uh, or where more than half of local governments within that, within that county were in declining fiscal health. So overall, pretty concerning picture in 2009. Uh, not enough green, certainly. By 2010, uh, things had gotten significantly worse. Uh, only one green shaded county left. Most of the counties that were yellow uh, have become red. Uh, and uh, that you know, clearly is a bad sign. By 2011, Things were starting to ease back, as we've seen on many of the slides, and the easing you know, appears to have begun uh, more so on the west side of the state than on the east side. And in 2012, uh, things continued to improve to the point where uh, very few red shaded counties left. Uh, some of the uh, yellow has turned to green, including here in, in, uh, in Kent County. Uh, so we think that this easing of the local government fiscal crisis has, is due to a, a number of factors certainly due to the improving economy. Uh, the Great Recession ended in 2009, although it's been a very slow uh, recovery. Uh, but we also think that this easing is due, uh, at least in part, to the right-sizing efforts of these local governments and uh, how, how they've been so proactive at trying to uh, cut their costs to downsize their fiscal needs and be able to live within reduced means. Uh, now, before we, uh, before we turn our attention away from the past and, and look to the future, uh, we want to get one last set of readings about fiscal health. And um, we were pretty surprised by, uh, by these findings. Um, uh, so the first key indicator on fiscal health is general fund balance. Uh, we looked at that previously. This is kind of the rainy day fund. And so we asked in 2012 uh, whether each government's uh, general fund balance is generally about right, or is it too low, or maybe isn't even too high. They may have a little bit too much money set aside. And what we found was that 66% um, uh, of local governments across the state uh, were, uh, told us that their general fund balance was uh, about at the right level. Uh, a small percentage, 5% overall, said it was actually too high. They had a little bit too much money uh, set aside at that point. Uh, overall, this is pretty good. There, there are areas of concern, especially in the, in the large urban communities. 41% said that their general fund balance was too low. Fairly significant percentages across all government sizes. So there is some concern here, uh, but overall, things could be worse. And the other uh, fiscal indicator is cash flow. Uh, and so we asked uh, whether cash flow was a problem or not. And 91% of jurisdictions told us that cash flow uh, was either uh, not much of a problem or not a problem at all. Uh, so we were surprised uh, that it was that high. Again, in, in the large urban places, 18% said it was somewhat of a problem. 2% said uh, it was a significant problem. Any jurisdiction that has a significant problem with cash flow is in very bad straits. But again, 91% overall said things were generally okay. Uh, and the last uh, uh, question on uh, on current uh, fiscal health, we asked local government leaders how satisfied they were with the package of services that they still deliver after having made all these cuts. And we were surprised to find that 79% uh, said that they were either very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with this package of services that they, that they still deliver today. Uh, and so again, uh, you know, that really tells us that this has been the era of trying to do more with less. Rather than cutting services uh, right away, they have looked to other sources uh, to deal with their fiscal stress. Uh, now, we wish that that was the end of the story. We could say that uh, the worst is behind us and, and local governments have come out generally okay. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not the end of the story. We asked them uh, what they see coming down the road, and there's a lot of concern. Uh, Deborah Horner will present that part now. Okay, yeah, that's right. 
So did you survive Tom's data-driven, a uh, <laughs> lot of data slides? Um, so the bad news is I also have some data slides for you. But the good news is I'm quicker. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, there we go. So I'm going to take over where Tom left off. Here we are. We've seen that the state's economy has improved slowly in the aftermath of the Great Recession. And more of Michigan's local government uh, currently reporting they're surprisingly OK, uh, that they're either holding steady, they're actually better able to meet their fiscal needs. And they're pretty satisfied with their right-sized service provision. But now a new pro uh, question presents itself. Will these local governments be able to sustain their operations at this new normal level, or will they face further retrenchment if the state system of funding local government as a whole doesn't keep up with the rising costs in the future? So as costs, these costs continue to rise, many of our local officials that we talk to worry that revenues won't keep pace. And though some local governments have been able to stabilize their current operations at reduced funding levels, there's concern going forward from here that the state system of funding local governments will come up short and force a new round of local government retrenchment in the future, that less with less. So the, um, it's gone? <laughs> Did it go away? <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so the MPPS actually asked uh, this question of our local officials. We said, do you believe that Michigan's system of funding local government uh, will provide adequate revenue in the coming years, assuming that the economy continues to improve, to allow you to maintain your current packages, a package of service that you currently provide? And fewer than half, 43% statewide, said that they believe the funding system will allow them to maintain their current package of services in the future, even with continued economic improvement. Optimism on this issue is uh, primarily found in Michigan's smaller jurisdictions. Let me see if I can do as well as Tom did with the little pointer. Probably not. Oh, there we go. Um, come back. There we go. Um, I'm not going to use the pointer. You guys are familiar with what these slides look like from Tom's uh, presentation. So optimism is found within the local, uh, the smaller jurisdictions, which co coincidentally tend to offer fewer services. And even among those small jurisdictions, less than half feel they can maintain their services going forward in the future, uh, even if the economy continues to improve. Meanwhile, the outlook is particularly pessimistic among the larger jurisdictions, where only 22% of state leaders believe the funding system will allow them to maintain what they're doing. Um, we can look at this issue on a county by county level. Uh, the counties in green on my map indicate those where 50% of the jurisdictions within them report they believe they can maintain their service levels going forward. The counties in red represent those where the majority of jurisdictions say they will not be able to maintain their level of services going forward. And of even more concern, the problem is, is the maintaining may not be enough. So as one of the, as Tom showed you in a lot of our tracking data, one of the things that we do track is um, whether or not officials feel that their service demands are increasing or decreasing year over year. And in this chart, you can see that we asked our local leaders whether they thought their, for example, human service needs are going to be increasing going up. And you can see that many of them say yes. From 2011 to, 2010 to 2011 and 2011 to 2012, these human service needs are increasing. And you can see that um, when it comes to public safety, the public safety needs also continue to rise not to ease. You can compare this rising levels with those fiscal stress slides that Tom showed where the, the slope was going the other direction. You can also see that infrastructure needs are even more dire. Almost half of all jurisdictions in the state and two thirds of the state's largest jurisdictions say their infrastructure needs have increased just in the past year from 2011 to 2012. Now, many jurisdictions have been delaying their infrastructure maintenance for some day in the future where they're going to be able to have more money available. And the local government officials that we talk to realize that they're going to have to pay that infrastructure piper very soon. In other words, looking at these three slides, we can predict that local governments don't just have to maintain what they're doing today. They're going to need to deal with increasing service demands in the future. What if they need to improve their services? What if they need more police officers out there to meet those public safety needs? What if they want to improve their roads and their sewer and their water systems to deal with degrading infrastructure they haven't dealt with over the past few years? Well, our local officials say good luck with that because only 26% of them say that Michigan's system of funding local governments, how they fund uh, their, their services, will provide adequate revenue to allow for improvement of current services or addition of new services in the future. Almost two in 10 strongly disagree they'll be able to add or improve services in the current system of funding. 
And on this side, among the state's largest jurisdictions, you can see in that tiny blue bar at the top, only 14% believe that our current system of funding local governments will allow them to improve or add to their package of services in the future. Almost half disagree. Again, looking from that bird's eye view, you can see there's only four counties in the state where the majority of jurisdictions say that they think they'll be able to improve or expand services going forward under the current system of local governments. And keep in mind, these responses are for a scenario that we put out that said that the economy is going to continue to improve. So that makes this outlook even bleaker if for some chance uh, Michigan's economy were to take a turn for the worse anytime soon. So the dark times have lightened recently for local jurisdictions as a result of retrenchment after the Great Recession. And according to local officials all across the state, the outlook isn't so good for the long term. So we wanted to know what they think is going to happen next. What are they going to do to forestall further cuts in local budgets that they've already seen years and years of cuts and right sizing and in order to protect those services that they're pretty satisfied with? Well, first of all, they believe there should be significant reform to the entire system. Indeed, 58% say they're either strongly or somewhat agree that the system for funding local governments needs significant reform. And only 16% say they disagree that it needs reform. Given that our larger jurisdictions do uh, have faced severe fiscal challenges over the last decade, it's not surprising that the belief in the need for reform is more common among the state's largest jurisdictions. Among local leaders from those big jurisdictions, 77% say we must reform the system, including 51% who say strongly believe that way. And still, even among those small jurisdictions, the one with few employees, the one with fewer pension and, and health care obligations, a majority, 52%, say that significant reforms are necessary. This is a great slide because it shows you that there is relatively bipartisan support for the need for reform of the local government funding system. There are only slight differences, bipartisan identification, among Michigan's local leaders on this topic. Those who identify themselves as independents or as Democrats uh, are more likely to believe that significant reform is necessary. However, a majority of uh, local officials who are Republicans also believe the system needs significant reform. They're supported of this across the aisle. So this is going to be a big slide. Get ready. OK. <laughs> what we did is we asked respondents, what should we do? We asked them, how important, if at all, do you believe it is to significantly reform a variety of elements of the funding system? So in this slide, the dark blue on the bars indicates the percentage of our respondents who said that it was very important to reform something. The light blue, slide, the light blue bar is somewhat of too important to um, fund to reform something, and the green is that it's not at all important. You can see we must change everything, <laughs> according to our local official respondents. Um, among the potential areas for reform that we actually talked about, the state's gas tax has the most widespread support for reform. 89% of those local leaders overall, overall think that the, um, the, among those who think that we need reform, they po point to the gas tax. And this corresponds to uh, one of the policy initiatives Governor Snyder uh, indicated in his State of the State address uh, earlier in this year. Widespread support for reform is also expressed for the state sales tax, which, as Tom said, is shared with the local governments as part of revenue sharing. There are also two aspects of property tax law that see a lot of support for reform among local officials. Um, the first is the Headley Amendment, and the second is Proposal A. Now, I don't claim to be a tax expert by any means, nor do I even play one on TV, but I will tell you a little bit about what the Headley Amendment and Proposal A do. The Headley Amendment regulates taxes unit-wide within a jurisdiction. And what it says is that as um, uh, property tax value within the jurisdiction grows, the local millage rate um, uh, must shrink back to keep up with the rate of inflation. So as a consequence, the, um, as property taxes go up, the millage rate is automatically what's called rolled back to maintain within the level of inflation. Overriding that kind of automatic rollback uh, requires a local vote of all the residents any time they want to raise it beyond what has rolled back and, uh, because of the Headley Amendment. For Proposal A, which also sees widespread support for reform, um, it's the, a similar kind of regulation on property tax, but for individual units. And it says that it limits tax increases on a specific unit of property um, at the rate of inflation or 5%, whichever is more, regardless of how fast property values are growing within a jurisdiction. 
what the combination of P Proposal A and, and the Headley Amendment did during the booming years of the property um, uh, increase in value is that it restricted local governments to be able to collect tax on some of the rising property costs. And since then, in the uh, intervening years where the property uh, values have collapsed, it has caused local prob uh, governments problem with these rollbacks and with the caps that have been put on the collection of taxes. So Proposal A and Headley are very much within the sights of local government leaders as in need of reform. Uh, in addition, you can see constitutional revenue sharing. Some of the things Tom talked about at the very beginning of his part of the, the conversation uh, is something that they believe need reform. And personal property tax, which is a tax on business items that are not nailed down, essentially, uh, was also a target for reform by local officials. Now, interestingly enough, we asked this question before personal property tax was brought up for uh, reform in the lame duck session in late 2012. So uh, it'll be interesting to track that over time as policy evolves on that particular issue. In addition, the Economic Vitality Incentive Program, which is what used to be statutory revenue sharing, is also targeted by local officials as, um, as a target for reform. Only 64% of them statewide say that that's something they believe is important for reform. But among those jurisdictions who are actually eligible for the Economic Vitality Incentive Program, 90% say we must reform this particular aspect of revenue generation. Um, there was also significant for support for reform of two other items that we asked about, local income tax law and support for reforming options for regional taxation, but uh, those were less popular among the items that we asked about. So on the survey, we had made this list of items and asked to rank the importance of how important those were, but then we followed that up with a question that was an open end. It was a Good. Uh, it was a big box on the survey, as you may have seen when there's these open ends like this on surveys you've done, where people could write in and tell us how they thought the system should be ref reformed, and in specific, um, what they considered the most important out of all of those things that we talked about or other things they might want to, um, to suggest to us. And all in all, there were 385 officials who provided over 880 suggestions for different ways of reforming the system. So we took all of those comments and we sorted them and we coded them and we looked for patterns within them of the comments that they suggested what was important to reform and how to do it. And the most common recommendations did focus on the issues related to the property tax. Uh, within the area, the bulk of suggestions talked about either eliminating the Headley Amendment, <laughs> eliminating Proposal A, or at the very least reforming them in order to provide more flexibility in the funding, uh, in funding and local tax policy. Um, recommendations for reform included things like easing the current revenue caps that pro the Proposal A and Headley provide, removing or easing those automated millage rollbacks that happen whenever uh, values go up, or finding ways to deal with the previously unforeseen effects of the housing sector collapse and the resulting drop in property values. So an example of, of one of the kind of comments we would get in this section of the survey uh, was I would pr revise Proposal A to get rid of the tax rate differences between homestead and non-homestead and eliminate the caps. I'd revise Headley Amendment so that millage rates could both be rolled back and rolled up without a vote of the people. The next most common set of recommendations we saw focused on the sales tax, with specific emphasis on increasing the rate of the tax, so increasing, increasing the state sales tax rate, increasing the tax base, so adding services in, or taxes on food, or taxes on internet sales, or allowing a local sales tax or local control of the, the state tax that uh, the state collects. And uh, what, this is one of my favorite quotes that came out of this section. It's a bit like a three-legged stool, a local official told us. Right now, we only have the ability to collect uh, revenues from one leg, that would be property taxes. And as a result, the whole system's unbalanced. Making it possible to levy a local sales tax or easier to levy an income tax would rebalance the stool and allow us to reduce our property tax rates. So needless to say, out of 880 comments, there was lots of other suggestions for places we could look for reform in the system of funding local governments. Issues related to revenue sharing, including constitutional revenue sharing and the EVIP, were the third most common uh, that res area respondents felt were important in need of reform. Within this area, suggestions clustered around providing more funding. Huh, really, they really want more money? That's a surprise. But interestingly, they were also very important to them to focus on stability and predictability. That year over year, as the state has cut their state aid to uh, uh, jurisdictions and their revenue sharing, that's made it very uncertain for local governments and how to budget for the future as they try to do year over year budgeting or even multi-year budgeting. 
Um, so they're looking for more stability, and they're looking to eliminate the EVIP by either restoring the regular statutory revenue sharing they'd done before, or just bundling it in with constitutional revenue sharing too. Um, suggestions specifically from county leaders included making counties eligible for revenue sharing as well. That was something we heard a lot of from county leaders. Um, so as I mentioned, there was overall 385 people who gave us almost 900 comments. And what I want you to take from that is that there is a lot of energy and eagerness and enthusiasm to begin this process of reforming and changing how the system works. But at the same time, the suggestions on what m was most important to people were all over the board. And there was little consensus on where to start. So let me summarize a little bit about this set of research that we've done through the Michigan Public Policy Survey. We've come through this long period of fiscal stress, falling revenues and rising costs that started before, but was made more severe by the Great Recession. But local governments, they were really active in how they were gonna respond. They largely preserved their fiscal health with a few notable exceptions across the state, uh, tried to protect their services uh, by taking other actions, intergovernmental cooperation, privatization, trying to, asking their employees to take on more of the burden of healthcare. But only 43% across the state say that their, the current system of funding local governments will allow them to maintain the services they have, and only 26% think that it's going to allow them to improve or add to the services they provide their citizens. Almost 60% say that the significant reform is needed, and only 16% say that it's not. And among them, overwhelmingly uh, large percentages say that each major piece of the interlocking system of funding local governments is in need of reform. But there's no particular consensus on where these fixes should start. So what we'd like to suggest that it is time to start the conversation about this system of funding local government. Not just tweaks to individual components, but by the state and local leaders working together, looking at the system as a whole and restructuring it and refining it uh, to provide Michigan's local governments with a, the support and the stability and the flexibility and the broad range of revenue uh, sources that they have in order to meet the needs, needs of their residents going into the future. So that's our presentation tonight. We look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. That was exciting with the yeah. <laughs> No trade? Sure. Be, before I ask the first question that came from the audience, let me compliment uh, close up for the uh, general work that you do. Uh, I don't know of another such focus in, in the state and uh, you do good work. Uh, and particularly your, your work with the Michigan Public Policy Survey, uh, your enduring focus on, on the subject matter uh, provides a great service. And I'm uh, particularly enamored with this, this particular topic tonight as a former local government official. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Getting to the first question, uh, uh, one of the uh, persons in the audience asked this. Was the survey data compared to empirical data, e.g., were actual fund balance levels compared to officials' perceptions of fund balance adequately? In, in other words, how does perception compare to reality? Yeah, so uh, with the Michigan Public Policy Survey, uh, the data that we gather are primarily opinion data. Uh, the, the questionnaires that we put out for these local leaders are, are actually very in-depth, um, seven, eight pages of uh, just item after item after item. Uh, and so, you know, we're very cognizant that these local leaders are extremely busy and they get a lot of requests to do surveys like this. So uh, we have decided um, with this survey that primarily uh, we ask questions that don't force them to, uh, to go through their books. Uh, we don't want them to actually do an audit. Uh, however, we do um, get data from, uh, we get what we call contextual uh, data. So for instance, uh, the state of Michigan gathers audit data from local governments and, and that's available. And so uh, we do our own uh, technical analysis behind the scenes to kind of calibrate and, and see how accurate uh, the responses are. Uh, and for the most part, what we found is, uh, is, uh, is pretty good. Um, we've, we've looked at a number of different things. Uh, once in a while, we see things that are, are maybe off uh, a little bit, but for the most part, we have uh, pretty high confidence in the data. And the other aspect of this kind of data quality gets back to that first, um, that first uh, slide that we put up, saying that this is a census-based survey and that we get 72% response rates. 
many types of uh, public opinion surveys will get 10, 15, 20% response rates. And that raises questions about whether the data are truly representative of the larger population. Uh, the fact that we are reaching out to every one of these local governments and we're getting responses from about three quarters of them uh, goes a long way to, uh, to make the data very high quality. One of the challenges, though, that we face in terms of comparing our data, contextual data, is that we're moving much faster than a lot of the contextual data we can get our hands on. So audits available for local governments, for one, they're not census. So we want not everyone within the state in any given fiscal year will turn in audit data to the state. Um, and then two, uh, that will be from 2009 or 2010 before the state releases that data and makes it available to us. Well, we are already have collected 2012 data and are moving into 2013 next week, <laughs> next month. <laughs> so, uh, so, so there is a challenge in terms of doing this, this double check against uh, what might be considered reality. But we have found when we have done it that our respondents are very reliable in their reports. They know what's going on in their jurisdictions. Second question, how important are unfunded obligations, unfunded mandates to the future of funding local governments? Did the survey uh, focus on that and uh, have you collected thoughts from some of the respondents on that subject? Yes, we have. Would you like to? Oh, oh sure. Um, so we actually asked about that in the spring of 2011. We asked two separate questions on, on their unfunded mandates. Uh, overall, about 31% of Michigan's local governments uh, report they don't offer retirement packages to former employees, so including about 43% of their states, the state's smallest jurisdictions, so they don't have to worry about it. But among the jurisdictions that do have future pension and retiree uh, obligations, um, about 35% of those local leaders feel that they're somewhat of a problem or a significant problem. So it's, it's over a third, but it's just a third. So depending on whether you want to see the glass two-thirds empty or two-thirds full, um, it's a, uh, it, it can be a significant problem for many of our jurisdictions. Uh, as you have seen through all the data we've collected, it's most severe among the largest jurisdictions where it's about 82% that say they have uh, significant or somewhat of a problem with their unfunded uh, obligations for retirees. And uh, similarly, many jurisdictions have unfunded health care obligations to retirees, and it's about similar levels of that for, the, for those obligations. So it is a concern for many uh, jurisdictions, particularly the big jurisdictions, going forward uh, as we look again, this prospective into the future, the problems that are coming down the pike. You mentioned that some local governments have actually been eliminating services. Do you have anything to share with us on what they're getting rid of? Yes, uh, for the most part, uh, we were actually uh, kind of surprised that uh, when we look statewide, uh, most local governments have been kind of trimming back uh, services rather than outright elimination of, uh, of complete services. Uh, I believe in, in the largest jurisdictions, though, I think 22 uh, percent, close to a quarter, have uh, completely eliminated uh, individual services. In many cases, they, uh, they work with uh, a public-private partnership to have someone else take on uh, services, but it can include things like, uh, like park uh, maintenance, uh, trash pickup, uh, recycling options. Uh, tends not to be you know, the, the, the most core services like public safety and so on. Uh, I, I think the big takeaway there is, again, that most local governments have really been trying to protect services and they've been trimming them back as opposed to kind of you know, slashing them out entirely. Have you asked local officials about the issue of uh, consolidation? Should small units around the state look into merging? Uh, we did ask about that uh, in our survey in fall 2010, which was our survey that we talked about intergovernmental cooperation. Toward the end of that summary, we said, Do you, have you outright considered uh, issues of joining together and merging with other jurisdictions uh, as a whole? In particular, we asked if they would, be, uh, they would do it in order to um, bolster their financial um, if, if, it made, if it made sense fiscally. Uh, very little support across the state, as you might imagine, for consolidation. Uh, most of us, particularly among the townships, townships are very protective of their township status, and we found that um, while county and city officials might be uh, more likely to agree that there are too many local governments in Michigan and maybe they should consolidate. Township officials, I think it was in the 70s, that said that they, would, they didn't think there were too many uh, local governments. And across the board, when we said, well, what about your local government? If it made fiscal sense for your local government to 
consolidate with ones around it. Uh, it was 15% support for what they thought their citizens would do. Um, it was about 15, 15 to 20% of what they thought if there was support in the community among businesses or among the jurisdiction's employees as to whether they thought consolidation was, would be a good idea for their jurisdiction. And then among local officials themselves who said, what about you personally? Do you think this is a good idea? Because we, sometimes we want to have them step back from their role as the jurisdiction and say, as a local leader, do you think this is good? And there was a little bit more support, again, when we said, if, if this made fiscal sense, would you do it? Uh, there was about a quarter of them who said, yeah, we'd, we'd consider consolidation. Um, but it was still uh, um, very, very low numbers that would, would support it. There were a couple of questions submitted on the general subject of the uh, personal property tax. Um, so let me throw out a couple of questions and, and you can uh, jump back and forth or add some insight. The first one is how important is the personal property tax to local governments? Uh, another one was, was any account taken of declining revenue due to the removal of personal property tax and its uncertain replacement funds? And, and I'll add one of my own and that is, uh, there was a large percentage of who felt that the personal property tax was in substantial need of reform. And I wonder whether or not that's because they know uh, the, the legislature and business is poised to eliminate it and so they want replacement funds? Or, uh, or, or is it something else that's afoot in terms of their interest in reform for the personal property tax? Well, the personal property tax, as Deborah mentioned, is it's a tax on businesses, on things like uh, furniture, artwork, uh, computers, and so on. It's, it's not a real property, such as land or buildings. Uh, it, uh, it affects local governments uh, in, a, in a wide range of ways. Uh, some jurisdictions get less than $100 of revenue from the personal property tax. Others get multiple millions of dollars of, of revenue through this uh, source. and. Um, uh, we asked how important uh, the, the personal property tax is uh, to local governments overall, and um, I believe a, a majority, a slight majority, said it's a very important portion uh, of their budgets. Um, there are a lot of arguments against the personal property tax. It's a fairly cumbersome uh, uh, system, both for uh, the businesses that have to pay it and for the local governments that have to audit it and, uh, and, and manage that revenue system. Uh, so I, I believe in terms of um, uh, the reform that local government leaders were talking about for the personal property tax, uh, they were primarily, uh, a, a lot of these local leaders agree that it, it is too cumbersome. Uh, they told us they, a significant portion told us they are not able to audit um, uh, what businesses report uh, as much as they would like to. Uh, so I think the reform was primarily to, uh, to look for an, uh, an easier, less burdensome uh, source of funding. Uh, but among those local governments who say it's a particularly important source of funding, uh, there's overwhelming support for it. Uh, they, um, they say they would much rather deal with the burdens of administering it and still get the, the revenue than not. They also told us that the, the problem they have with reforming the personal property tax was they didn't really trust the state government to come up with the replacement funds. So they said, hey, if the government writes into the Constitution that they will replace these funds fully, we're all for it. 70, 80 percent said, please, let's reform this as long as we get full replacement and it's guaranteed to us. We said, well, what if it's guaranteed but you're only going to get partial replacement funds? They said, no. No, we don't trust the state to actually give us those funds. Um, so there was a big trust gap we found when we asked this battery of questions about the, re the issue of replacement. So they said, we need the money. We hate gathering the money. Um, we would like to reform how it's gathered, but if the state tells us we can't gather it anymore, we need replacement, and we're not sure we're going to get that um, out of the current uh, um, system. So that was that's kind of the, the arc of their concerns about the personal property tax. Two questions came in on the general subject of the Michigan Fair Tax. Um, since 2005, the Michigan Fair Tax Group has been trying to get residents to adopt that type of change in funding Michigan governments. Uh, what is your stance on the Michigan fair tax? Uh, is it possibly an avenue to create more stable funding for state and local government? Well, uh, we got a few uh, suggestions from local leaders about uh, uh, moving to the fair tax. Uh, the, the fair tax, uh, as I understand it, would, uh, would replace um, most uh, forms of taxation with, a, I believe it's a, thing, it's, it's a form of sales tax 
kind of a, a flat, uh, much, much higher uh, rate uh, than our current 6%, uh, and it would apply to uh, many more types of purchases, including services and so on. Uh, we did not get a lot of suggestions from local uh, leaders that we should move to the fair tax. Uh, uh, I believe there are a lot of economic arguments, um, uh, concerns about it that uh, it can be kind of regressive. So for, uh, for lower income citizens, uh, it could potentially have a larger burden if they're paying a large uh, tax rate on, uh, on food and medicine and, uh, and things like that. So uh, in our surveys, uh, this, did, this was not uh, a particularly uh, common suggestion to move to the fair tax. Government re response addressed mostly, mostly uh, cuts to the budget in terms of solving the, the fiscal problem. Has uh, there been many requests for uh, additional revenue from citizens uh, by asking for tax increases as a way to solve the problem, or uh, is just everyone so beaten up at the prospect and down about the likelihood of having taxpayers empty their pockets even more in this day and age? Well, our survey is, uh, is just of the local officials, not of, not of citizens, uh, so we can't directly answer that. But uh, one thing that we have found that is really pretty fascinating to us, we've, we've asked local leaders a, a couple of times about if they had more authority at the local level to raise taxes uh, themselves, how likely would they be to do that? Uh, and it turns out they say uh, not likely at all, whether it's uh, increasing their, their property millage rate, uh, even less likely that they would uh, uh, try to implement uh, a local income tax. Uh, also uh, extremely unlikely that they would try to uh, implement a sales tax. So local leaders themselves seem uh, pretty unlikely to, uh, to try to take on the burden of higher taxes at the local level. We also asked them uh, whether they think they're citizens, if, if it was up to the citizens, whether citizens would choose to pay higher taxes and, and get more services or whether they would choose lower taxes and fewer services. And uh, for the most part, other than uh, on fire, fire protection and roads, uh, local leaders seem to think that their citizens would choose lower taxes and fewer services. But uh, a, a, another uh, terrific organization, the Center for Michigan, has, uh, has done some unofficial tallying uh, on the last two sets of statewide uh, primaries. And they have found 90% uh, of local millages have been approved, uh, both in August of 2010 and in August of 2012. Uh, most of those have been, uh, and for, for scale, in August of 2012, there were over 800 statewide uh, requests for local millage increases. 90% of those were approved by the citizens. Uh, same, roughly same numbers in August of 2010. And uh, maybe most surprising of all, uh, those high percentages of approval were really across the board, whether it was for uh, police services, fire services, roads, uh, parks and recreation, um, transportation, senior uh, services. Uh, so uh, there's some kind of uh, interesting thing going on where local government leaders are concerned that their citizens just aren't interested in raising taxes, but when it goes to a vote of the citizens in the last uh, couple of rounds, there's been overwhelming approval. Uh, your, your comments on unfunded mandates must have triggered another question on the subject. Uh, this questioner uh, writes, unfunded, unfunded mandates are when the state mandates the local unit do something without funding it, such as enforcing a new state law. Uh, have you looked at, at that aspect of unfunded mandates? Here you go. The, um, uh, this also came up in, uh, so as, as Deborah pointed out, we asked uh, at the end of the survey, we asked an open-ended question where local leaders could just tell us whatever they thought was the most important thing to fix. Uh, and uh, dealing with unfunded uh, mandates did come up. It wasn't the most common thing, but it was relatively common. Uh, so uh, this is one thing we did not uh, put in our slides, but uh, back in 2009, uh, Governor Granholm and uh, the leaders of the Michigan uh, Senate and House uh, uh, created the Legislative uh, Commission on Statutory Mandates to, to look at this issue. Uh, as part of the Headley Amendment in, in 1978, the state government was supposed to be, um, was, was supposed to be restricted from uh, placing any more unfunded mandates on local government. They couldn't ask local government to do anything new if they didn't provide the funding to do it. Uh, they have clearly broken that, uh, that law for 30 years. And uh, this legislative commission uh, that was uh, created by the state legislature 
uh, looked at this very closely in 2009 and determined uh, they couldn't identify all of the underfunded mandates that had been put in place, but for the ones that they could, uh, they estimated there were more than two and a half billion dollars of expenses that local governments had to take on uh, that by law they should not have had to. So that's uh, yet another driver of this fiscal crisis, you know, beyond the falling revenues, uh, the state government has, has imposed new mandates on local governments and required them to spend money to do it without, without funding it. And once in a while, actually, local governments, including local schools, have sued the state to, to, when they've imposed uh, unfunded mandates and won, and the state has had to retract them. But as the Grand Home Commission found, that is less likely to be the case than the local governments um, just suffering under and, and taking on the burden without the, the funding from the state. This questioner wants to know, uh, did you have opportunity to collect uh, feelings from local government officials about uh, EVIP strings attached to funding? Uh, that's a relatively new development. Uh, and so uh, what, what can you tell us about perspective from local officials on that subject? Right. So, uh, so back in 2011, uh, the uh, Governor Schneider recommended that we move from this statutory revenue sharing where the legislature allocates a specific amount to a small group of, of local governments. Not every local government was uh, um, eligible for statutory revenue sharing. And they moved that pot of money into this program called EVIP, the uh, Economic Vitality Incentive Program. And instead of giving the money to the local gov that, that small group of local governments, um, they actually said that you have to earn the money by hitting specific targets. Uh, we're going to ask you to, for example, increase your governmental, intergovernmental cooperation. We're going to ask you to increase the amount of health care costs that your employees uh, pay uh, as part of your health care costs. We're going to ask you to run a local government dashboard where up online or someplace in your jurisdiction there's information about this fiscal health about your jurisdiction that citizens could see as part of a transparency and accountability effort. So that if they did any of these three um, types of policy change, they could then access the money. And so they were incentivized to change their policies to meet these policies and then get that, that statutory revenue sharing of what it used to be. Um, local governments had a, a somewhat of a problem with this <laughs> in a couple of ways. Uh, one of the things that we heard the most in terms of the, the dissatisfaction with the EVIP program is a lot of people, as Tom said, were already doing intergovernmental cooperation. In fact, 70% across the state. Those people didn't actually get credit for the intergovernmental cooperation they were already doing, they were asked to do more intergovernmental cooperation. So a lot of our local officials told us, look, this is, this is just make work. We're, we're not saving money by doing these extra programs. We're just making up new programs to do in order to get the state money. Or, um, or we've already asked our, our um, employees to increase their health care costs last year. We can't get credit for that in order to get this EVIP money. And so there was some, some, some uh, protests uh, by local officials about how the, the program was structured and how they, they were being asked to, to jump through hoops, as they put it, in order to, that was actually a quote from, from one of our officials, to chase this money that they used to get um, just directly from the state government through revenue sharing. And uh, so one of the things that we pointed out in these slides is that uh, fiscal health and, and fiscal challenges tend to be um, worse in, in the large urban communities and not quite as bad in the, in the smaller jurisdictions. But uh, on, on this EVIP uh, program in particular, from the small jurisdictions, uh, uh, they tend to provide very few services in the first place. And uh, tied into what Deborah said, if they already were working with a neighboring jurisdiction to provide those services, they simply didn't have the opportunity uh, to expand that in intergovernmental cooperation. And so they were kind of you know, cut off from this EVIP funding, uh, even if they should have been able, uh, eligible to, to get it. And those small jurisdictions too have very few employees. And so if you have new regulations with new paperwork being asked to create dashboards, being asked to do these document these things and provide documentation to the state, that's just another layer of work you're being asked to, to lay upon the, the jurisdiction in order to chase less funding than they used to get before. So it was a very frustrating process for them to, to have this introduced. The other thing that I mentioned is one of the things that, that came up over and over again in the comments of these local governments is we really need stability. We really need predictability. We need to know what we're getting year for year. And one of the problems with the EVA program is it's not very clear what kind of incentives they're going to be asked to do year over year. Are we going to continue to have to do dashboards? Are we going to have to continue to increase our intergovernmental cooperation year over year and, find, and, and scurry around to find new programs? And so it was this unpredictability issue, too, that is really difficult for local governments that, that need to be able to predict, uh, look ahead in their budgets to be able to know what they're going to have for the following year. 
Uh, and one last thing I'd like to say about uh, intergovernmental cooperation uh, is these local leaders who are, who are doing this stuff uh, are overwhelmingly satisfied with it. Uh, so as we said, about 70% of these jurisdictions were already doing formal uh, service sharing with a, a neighboring jurisdiction. Among those uh, 70, 72%, uh, over 80% said that they were very satisfied with how it was going uh, and, and meeting its goals, whether that was to cut costs or to provide better services. Uh, and uh, so we have been uh, kind of, you know, uh, in this presentation, uh, pointing out some of the difficulties with intergovernmental cooperation that is already so widespread. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say uh, there's, there still are lots of opportunities for local governments to continue to expand some of this, especially in, in the really large jurisdictions that provide a lot of services. I think we'll continue to see growth in, in service sharing. Uh, so it's, it's not completely cut off, but in particular for these small jurisdictions, it'll be difficult to continue to try to expand that. We've exhausted questions from the audience, so I'm going to exercise my prerogative to ask you the last question. And it's a toughie. <laughs> um, you've done a great service by putting a, a spotlight on the, uh, the subject matter and asking the question, is the funding of local government in Michigan a, a broken system? I happen to agree with those who, who think it is. Uh, but I also know that uh, identifying and putting a focus on the problem, uh, it can be many moons before anything is actually done about it, even when. Uh, the vast majority of uh, respondents are, are near universal in calling and demanding for change. I can remember as a graduate student at the Ford School doing a master's thesis on the need for school finance reform. This was, this was back a long time ago. And uh, it was many, many years after that before there was even a partial uh, cure for the problem. So. Um, since you prognosticate and look, uh, if you would look in your crystal ball and give us your own sense, and you can have different opinions of your optimism that because the crisis has been so clearly identified, because so much is at stake, uh, what, are your pro what are your thoughts about the prospects for actual reform to avoid the future that most local government officials fear? Well, I think my sense is uh, we have not seen uh, this as a high priority in Lansing uh, currently. This uh, has not been the topic of discussion. Uh, the governor's budget that was presented uh, in February uh, really didn't include uh, significant new funds for local government, uh, much less fixing the system. Uh, I think a lot of local government leaders would be uh, happy simply to get some kind of boost in funding right now, even if the system uh, wasn't fixed. Uh, and not even that uh, seems to be on the table right now. So uh, I think my sense is uh, it seems uh, likely that uh, it may take a while uh, to make significant progress on this. On the other hand, uh, just within the last couple of months, I think uh, at the local level, we really are starting to see a groundswell on this issue. Uh, that comment that we showed uh, from uh, Ed Kurtz, uh, this is uh, you know, the, the state government's uh, appointee to fix Flint is saying, the system of, of finance is broken uh, and we have to fix it. Otherwise, all urban core communities are gonna end up looking like Flint. So uh, I think we're seeing kind of a groundswell here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be on the agenda yet. On the other hand, we've seen with the current um, uh, administration and legislature in Lansing, they can move very quickly if and when they decide uh, that something is important enough. So. Uh, yeah, There's was, always some hope. Right. Well, I was going to say, too, you know, the EVIC program, for all of its um, uh, difficulties in being administered at the local level and the, and the uh, um, criticisms that local leaders would level at it, um, is an attempt, I think, to, to move things along in terms of reform at the local level. And then again, too, the, the PPT uh, tax uh, reform that the legislature and the governor were try was trying to do at the end of 2012. So it, it does appear there's some incremental movement in that direction. And so what we're hoping to do by bringing this to the forefront is talk about the need for a holistic approach. And so instead of just biting it at different pieces of the puzzle to look at the entire uh, the entire picture. So um, so the, uh, there may be some, some work on the margins and it would be great if we could dig in and look at the system as a whole. Kurt, I was your boss for I've got a couple of reasons for saying that. Two of my degrees are from the University of Michigan. All right. 
Go blue. The other one is that for 12 years, I was the mayor of this city and their boss, the city manager, from 1991 to 2003. Something in the brochure that came out, why I came, because you quoted, I'm quoting your brochure that I got at home, the majority of Michigan's local leaders think our system of funding local government is broken. Well, it is broken. But I didn't hear much time. I did come in a little late, and I may have missed a part of this. I know I missed a part of uh, on revenue sharing. But cities are nothing more than an arm of state government. We tend to think that there are three levels, local, state, and federal. No, there's really only two in Michigan. There's the federal, and there's the state. And we can't do anything as cities without express permission from Lansing. And that's carried through into our 1963 Constitution. And in that Constitution, it was interesting because as you pointed out, and I know, and heard you very well, revenue sharing was cut in half. Constitutionally, it was money that the legislature couldn't tinker with. They didn't trust them, so they said, you can't touch that. The other half, they said, okay, go ahead with that. Well, when I became mayor, and the first year was 1992, this city got $28 million of revenue sharing without any strings attached, without proving anything or doing anything, it was part of the partnership between the state government and the cities. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gone. The EBIT program is a postage stamp compared to what happened. And I've watched it diminish on three different now uh, governorships under Engler, under Granholm, and now under the current governor. This has been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away without any replacement, without any tightening your belt lay off people in good times even we saw this happen and i think you people need to understand that this history is what's driving this situation well the the people trying to do their best in their jobs at local government are cutting corners and squeezing and trying to figure out new ways to do things and yes consolidating this city and during my watch led in some consolidation so it is six city rapid they just got 32 million bucks from the federal government to put the first brt line in the midwest active so we were doing things like that, but we were being squeezed. Yeah. I've been out of office almost 10 years, and I sound a little grumpy because I've been watching what's been happening here, and I didn't hear much about that. You know, the revenue sharing was a huge thing. We're the second biggest city in the second largest metropolitan area. It was a huge thing. Yeah. The personal property tax was a huge thing without replacement. They're talking about, they already cut it off. Yeah. So it's dead, but there isn't, they didn't put them, said, to, here's, here's what we think we're going to do. What do you think about that? Now it's after the fact. It's just gone. Yeah. I don't know whether that's, what, nine million bucks? Some like for the city of Grand Rapids, just gone. Yeah. So when you're talking about how to fix it, you better understand better than I heard tonight why and how we got into this mess. Uh, well, I, I hope, think, yes. Uh, I hope that, that, that when you go back and and look at that. Of course there's a bipartisan thing across the board. Mayor LaGuardia in New York City 75 years ago said there's neither a Republican or Democratic way to clean the streets. Yeah. And, and so, so I'm, I'm well, going to, I'm well, sorry, I'm going to suggest that our um, panel make a very brief response to what is a really important topic, but we also have a reception outside to continue the conversation. <laughs> That's right. Do you have, I mean, th these are very important topics. And come we to very much appreciate having them raised. If uh, yeah. you have a brief comment. Yeah, I do. I just want to, I want to come to Tom's defense, because he did, st our very first slide in the entire presentation was the big red gap between revenue sharing that we saw in the 90s and, and, its, and its increased decline. So, so Tom did cover it. Uh, and I think uh, what I'd say, uh, Mayor Logia? Logie. Logie. Uh, uh, I think what I would say is uh, you're absolutely right. Local government uh, is simply a creature of the state. It doesn't exist unless the state says there can be cities and villages and townships and so on. And uh, it really is supposed to be a partnership. I mean, local governments provide the frontline services to all of us citizens, uh, but those you know, ultimately are uh, state level. Uh, state uses local government to get these local services provided. And there doesn't seem to be a partnership uh, these days. Uh, it seems to be uh, somewhat more adversarial. We've also asked questions about local leaders' trust in state government, and it's extremely low. Uh, there, uh, there is a broken relationship between local and state government in Michigan, and I think the, the revenue sharing is a big part of it. Did you uh, say term limits? Yes, term limits uh, <laughs> may be an issue. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, uh, th this absolutely is, is a, a major thing going on. We're about to go into the field with our next survey and we're going to be digging into some, uh, some of these issues again. So uh, thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Well, this is clearly an ongoing topic of very great importance. I wanted to thank Tom and Deborah for sharing some of Close Up's work and their perspectives on this topic. I'd like to thank Kurt for asking the questions and the mayor for his questions as well. But I'd particularly like to thank each of you for joining us this evening and for engaging with us. I have to say that was a tremendously thoughtful and vital set of questions that you pose to our speakers and we really appreciate that. We do have a light reception that is just outside the auditorium. We hope that you will stay and join us to continue the conversation. Clearly there are many issues on the table. These surveys will continue and we hope that we will encourage you to take a look at some of the results that come going forward. So with that, please join me in thanking both Tom and Deborah.